in you again I'm made new I'm made new You're making me stronger You're healing my heart With your hands you hold me in You set me apart Now I make new Because of you yeah. You hold my head up You remind me who I am You hold my head up I'm alive in you again I'm made new
my fears and doubts, they can all come to, because they can't stay long when I believe you are the way, the truth, the life, I believe you are the way, the truth. Good morning, church family. Good morning. Yeah, thank you, Mark. As Mark mentioned, my name is John. Uh, I'm a longtime member of North Christian Church, and I'm honored to get the opportunity to come up and share with you guys this morning. Uh, first, though, as you walked in, you probably received one of these bulletins. Uh, I'm just going to highlight a couple of the things in there this morning, uh, but please read through all of it. Uh, Matt told me before that he was looking forward to hearing from you guys this week, so if you have any questions, call Matt. <laughs> he gave me a look. <laughs> uh, first, uh, I wanted to hi or show, point out that uh, our, our children's ministry uh, is going to be doing, um, where is it here? They're going to be doing a little program for us here. Uh, I believe that's next Sunday. Where am I at? Is that right? Yeah, next Sunday at 6.30, right here in the sanctuary. Thank you. Uh, and afterwards, there's going to be refreshments and stuff. So please, plan to attend that. I know they've been working hard on it. They've had a few rehearsals and stuff now. So please, plan to join us here. Uh, also, uh, today is the last day uh, to bring in your things for the angel tree, uh, the gifts to the Salvation Army. Uh, you probably noticed all the gifts out there by the tree when you came in. Uh, if you didn't get them here today, that's all right. Don't panic. Uh, but please take them to the Salvation Army location. Uh, there's still plenty of time before Christmas, so we encourage you to still grab a tag, too, if you haven't had an opportunity to do that. Uh, just remember, please take it to the Salvation Army directly. Or have it here before 12, which I'm not sure how you would do that. But uh, regardless... Thank you for those that have, have done that, uh, which kind of brings me to my uh, offering meditation. You know, it's pretty awesome this time of year to see all the generosity uh, that people have that, uh, that pours out from them. Uh, you know, and it's, it's, it's fun to see the people's joy and smiles on their faces when they give. Uh, Christmas season uh, is just that kind of type of year. You know, people are willing to stand out in the cold, ringing a bell, encouraging people to drop their change in the bucket. You know, maybe they donate meals or go down to the Salvation Army and help cook. Now, there's lots and lots of ways we can give this Christmas season. Um, you know, and that's really awesome to see. Is it the same when you tithe? We should tithe and show God how awesome he is. After all, he owns everything, and everything on earth and beyond is holy to him. When we tithe, we offer him what is his, and show that we recognize this ownership as a constant blessing upon all of us. After all, God does love a cheerful giver. So if you would uh, joyfully consider giving to God today, there are several ways to do that in North Christian Church. Uh, we don't pass a tithing bucket or anything like that at second service. We truly believe that that is between you and God. Uh, but if you would like to give, you can do that online at northchristianchurch.com. Or you could mail a check to the church, if anybody still has those. Or you could put an offering in the box, uh, which is by the three entryway doors as you come in. Uh, as we transition into the communion meditation today, I was thinking back to a story that I had once heard. A group of international students uh, were traveling to the Rocky Mountains uh, while their university was on break. Uh, they joined another church group uh, to go and explore the Rocky Mountains, and on their way, they were asking uh, the United States kids all about it, you know, what, what, what's the climate like in the Rocky Mountains, you know, what, what grows there, what kind of animals are we going to be able to see, uh, and it was quite mystifying to them. Uh, as they kind of peaked the first hill while the mountains were still way off in the distance, they peaked this first hill and they began to be able to see the mountains off in a distance and all the chatter in the van grew quiet and uh, they grabbed their cameras and were taking pictures and it was real quiet and kind of they were kind of in awe and wonder. 
hopefully we uh, experience something similar uh, around the communion table. You know, we've read many scriptures and passages uh, that have talked about the spiritual significance of this sacred meal. Seeing the Lord's Supper from a distance helps us appreciate the mystery of the crucifixion of Christ. In, real in, in reality, the closer we get to the sacrifice of Jesus, the more we are driven to respond in awestruck silence. The table that represents his broken body uh, and shed blood openly displays the grandeur of God's unconditional love through the gift of his son. Uh, as, as Psalms 46.10 advises, be still and know that I am God. The sacrifice of Jesus is before us today. It's no longer at a distance. It's up close and it's personal. As you respond in quietness and humility, when uh, we would invite uh, the Lord to impress upon your heart the height of his love. Uh, would you ask him to help you comprehend the grandeur of, in his, of his mis, <laughs> a majestic grace? Most of all, take some time to be humble and be still and know that he is God. Uh, as we prepare to take communion today, you can do so after Matt's sermon. Um, there will be a, slide, a few slides that play on the television. Uh, take some time and examine yourself today. When you are ready, uh, while the music plays, please get up. There's communion in all four corners of the room. Uh, do so whenever you're ready. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we thank you uh, for your unconditional love. We thank you for uh, your grandeur and splendor, Lord. Uh, and we just thank you for this opportunity that we have to take uh, this, uh, take a part of your communion offering today, Lord. I just pray that you'd be with us. Help us all to examine our hearts as we do that. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. How are we? Good, good, good. Uh, Hebrews chapter 11 this morning. Hebrews chapter 11. Uh, we are this year uh, finishing up now the journey. So uh, if you've been with us all year, then this is nothing new to you. But we started at the beginning of January, working our way through the Bible chronologically together. Uh, and over the last almost uh, year, uh, we have just in chronological order been working our way through different stories, different events that happened throughout the journey of the Bible. And so now we are nearing the end. We have today, and then we finish up on Sunday morning, we finish up uh, the journey next week. And so I hope it's been a beneficial journey for you, uh, but we are wrapping this up. Uh, if you have your, your bulletin, like what John was referring to, uh, then you have uh, a little section on there in the back uh, for notes and whatnot, then you likely understand that today we are talking about this concept of faith. We're talking about this concept of faith. What is faith? What does faith look like? What, is, what did it look like in, in the Bible? What does it look like for us now? And so uh, if, if you're familiar with your Bible as well, turning to Hebrews chapter 11, uh, you probably know what we're talking about. You're likely, you, you've likely read this chapter a number of times. Uh, Hebrews 11 is known as the Bible's hall of fame of faith, if you will. Uh, it's, it's notable individuals from the Old Testament that lived out faith in significant ways. Uh, and, and the writer of Hebrews is, is teaching us a lesson really with this uh, on, on how faith can be really lived out. The writer of Hebrews is unknown. You may have your opinion about who wrote Hebrews. You may have studied it or maybe, uh, you know, went to college and maybe a professor told you. Just from my perspective, we don't know who the writer is of Hebrews because we're not told. Uh, the Hebrews nowhere says that it was written by Paul or John or, you know, anybody else, right? Uh, and so you may have an idea, but we're not told directly from Scripture. The, the writer of Hebrews uh, comes from a Jewish background, uh, we believe, and he's writing to Jew Jews who are scattered around kind of the area. They're scattered uh, around the, the known area, and, and the writer is encouraging them in their Christian faith, uh, a lot of them coming out of the Jewish circle uh, into the Christian circle, and so he's trying to encourage them to remain faithful, to remain true. And, and as you read through Hebrews, uh, the author consistently makes an appeal uh, to the supremacy of Christ. Christ is above all. He is, our, his, he is our great high priest, he says throughout Hebrews as well. There is much Old Testament in the book of Hebrews. Uh, if you want a good Old Testament kind of preview, read through the book of Hebrews. They do a great job of, of touching on many of the events through 
the Old Testament, but there's always in the book of Hebrews, always this connection to uh, Christ in the New Testament, and Christ is supreme, and Christ is in authority above all. So, uh, we are going to read Hebrews chapter 11 here together. We're going to read through this hall of fame uh, of faith, and uh, as I'm reading through this, as we're reading through this together, Hebrews chapter 11, I want you to maybe look at and notice not only the individuals, if you're familiar with your Old, Old Testament, then you're going to pick up on some of these stories that you know, but also look at how they lived, look at what they did, and look at how they responded to ultimately their faith. So read with me uh, Hebrews chapter 11, starting in verse 1. It says this, now faith is the reality of what is hoped for, the proof of what is not seen. For our ancestors won God's approval by it. By faith, we understand that the universe was created by God's command, so that what is seen has been made from the things that are not visible. By faith, Abel offered to God a better sacrifice than Cain did. By faith, he was approved as a righteous man, because God approved his gifts, and even though he is dead, He still speaks through his faith. By faith, Enoch was taken away, so he did not experience death. And he was not found to, uh, I'm sorry, he was not to be found because God took him away. For prior to his removal, he was approved, since he had pleased God. Now, without faith, it is impossible to please God, for the one who draws near to him must believe that that he exists and rewards those who seeks him. By faith, Noah, after he was warned about what, what was not yet seen and motivated by godly fear, he built an ark to deliver his family. By faith, he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness that comes from faith. By faith, Abraham, when he was called, obeyed and went out to a place that he was going to receive as an inheritance. He went out not knowing where he was going, By faith, he stayed as a foreigner in the land of promise, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, co-heirs of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city that, that has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. By faith, even Sarah herself, when she was unable to have children, received power to conceive offspring, even though she was past the age since she considered that the one who had promised was faithful. Therefore, from, from one man, in fact, from one as good as dead, came offspring as numerous as the stars of heaven and as innumerable as the grains, the grains of sand by the seashore. These all died in faith without having received the promises, but they saw them from a distance, greeted them, and confessed that they were foreigners and temporary residents on the earth. Now, those who say such things make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they were thinking about where they came from, they would have an opportunity to return. But they now desire a better place, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. He received the promises, and he was offering Isaac his unique son, the one it had been said about, your seed will be traced through Isaac. He considered God to be, even, to be able even to raise someone from the dead, and as an illustration, he received him back. By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. By faith, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph, and he worshiped, leaning on the top of his staff. By faith, Joseph as he was nearing the end of his life, mentioned the exodus of the Israelites and gave instructions concerning his bones. By faith, after Moses was born, he was hidden by his parents for three months because they saw that the child was beautiful and they didn't fear the king's edict. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter and chose to suffer with the people of God rather than to enjoy the short-lived pleasures of sin. For he considered the reproach because of the Messiah to be greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, since his attention was on the reward. By faith, he left Egypt behind, not being afraid of the king's anger, for Moses 
uh, persevered as one who sees him who is invisible. By faith, he instituted the Passover and, and the sprinkling of the blood so that the destroyer of the firstborn might not touch the Israelites. By faith, they crossed the Red Sea as though they were on dry, dry land. And when the Egyptians att- attempted to do this, they were drowned. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after being encircled by the Israelites for seven days. By faith, Rahab the prostitute received the spies in peace and didn't perish with those who, dis- who disobeyed. And what more can I say? Time is too short for me to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets, who by faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, obtained promises, shut the mouths of lions, quenched the, raz- the raging uh, of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, gained strength after being weak, became mighty in battle, and put foreign armies to flight. Women received their dead, and they, rece- they were raised to life again. Some men were tortured, not accepting release, so that they might gain a better resurrection, and others experienced mockings and scourging, as well as bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawed in two, they died by the sword, they wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, afflicted, and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and on mountains, hiding in caves and in holes in the ground. All these were approved through their faith, But they did not receive what was promised since God had provided something better for us so that they would be made perfect without us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, I'm thankful that we get the opportunity to gather. Thank you that uh, we get the opportunity to open your word, to dive into uh, what you said to these Christians 2,000 years ago, God, and, and be challenged by this, be encouraged by this, be convicted by this even today. God, I pray that uh, you use this time as a time uh, in order to do do just those things. uh, We just pray that you'd give us the the eyes to see and the ears to hear what you want to do and say and show us this morning, God. And then give us the courage and the strength to step out and follow where you desire to lead. We love you. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for everything that he's done for us. Pray this in the name of our Savior, Jesus. Amen. So what is faith? That really is the question that we're dealing with this morning. What is faith? Faith is one of those uh, churchy words, I think, that we throw around, people use often, but we might not have a firm grasp or a firm understanding of what the word actually means. Uh, There's a lot of churchy words like this, sanctification, righteousness, atonement, all all of these words. I I think faith fits that as well. I think we use it often, but we maybe don't understand a a full scope uh, of what it means or what it really, how it really applies to us. I I think for many of us, faith is one of these things that's very, uh, very intellectual in our minds. It's, it's very, for, for many of us, it can be a feeling. Like faith is, is a feeling for some of us. It's, it's an emotion. It's a, it's a state of being. It's a, it's a mindset. It's a, it's a mental activity that we go through. We, we say things like, I have faith, meaning that I, that I mentally think something to be true. Or, or we say things like, I feel my faith. I feel like I have faith, meaning that I have the warm and fuzzies inside, right? Like, like I'm feeling it, so it must, it must be true. Uh, faith is not a feeling, <laughs> Faith is not a feeling. Let me just get that out of the way, out of the way right, right out of the gate. Biblically, uh, we have only barely scratched the surface with these answers to what is, what is faith. Faith is more than a feeling. It's more than intellect. It's more than knowledge. It's more than a mental activity that we go through. Faith is, is knowing what's going to happen because of what already has happened. Uh, faith is the consideration the thought process of what God has done in the past and putting that consideration into action in the choices that we make in the present. Are you tracking with me? We're going to unpack this more, so don't worry. When we read the word faith in our Bible, we ought to maybe go through an exercise that many of us probably have never done before. When we read the word faith in Scripture, 
we ought to think about and maybe even replace it at times with other words that, that might, in our English language, might uh, convey the meaning a little bit more appropriately. Uh, we have other words that maybe describe it uh, better, like fidelity, like loyalty, like allegiance, like commitment. As we're reading through our Bible and we read the word faith, we ought to maybe from time to time fill that word in with commitment or loyalty or allegiance or fidelity. Let's illustrate it this way. Uh, We can say in one sense, I'm faithful to my spouse. I'm faithful to my wife, right? Uh, We may not use the word faithful, but uh, we, we, would, we would go on to say, well, I'm, I'm committed to my spouse, or, or I have vows to my spouse, or I have made a, made, a, made a promise to my spouse, or I have a covenant with my spouse. We can say those words with our mouths all day long, but if I, if I go out, if I say those words and I go out and I have an affair, uh, no one is going to call me faithful in that moment. No, nobody's going to say, oh, that's a faithful husband, because he said that he's faithful, Right? Because, because we're just giving it lip service in that moment. It's not actually flowing through the actions that we have and the actions that we perform in our lives. The same is true biblically when we look at faith, when we consider faith. It's not, it's not just a, a, a mental aspect where we think or we intend or we believe in something. There's action attached to it. There's action attached to faith. But even more than that, let's build on it, it's also not a blind faith. You've heard blind faith before, right? You've heard this concept where we hear the phrase, uh, that person just has, has blind faith, meaning they, they have this, this faith with no reason for it, no good reason to have the faith. Well, that's not exactly biblical either. And we get good examples of that from Scripture. Uh, we're going we're gonna to jump around Hebrews 11 um, from several different places here. So, uh, if you have your Bibles, just stay in Hebrews 11 with me. A few examples. Hebrews 11, verse 11 uh, is one. Uh, It says this, by faith, even Sarah herself, uh, when she was unable to have children, received power to conceive offspring, even though she was past the age, since she, what's the word there? Considered. Since she considered that the one who had promised was faithful. You, You know the story behind this right? Likely you've heard this. This is out of Genesis. Most of these stories out of, of, um, out of Hebrews 11 come from Genesis. Uh, in, in the book of Genesis, God calls a man by the name of Abraham and his wife Sarah, and he, and he says to them, you are going to uh, be multiplied. Your descendants are going to be multiplied. He says things like, uh, your descendants are going to be as numerous as the stars in the heaven or as numerous as the sands on the, sh- on the seashore, okay? That's a lot of, a lot of people, right? My wife comes from a large family. That's a lot more than the eight kids that she has, right? So that's a lot of people. So Abraham and Sarah have this promise that God has, give, has given them, and they grow older and older and older, and what happens? If you know the story, what happens? They don't have kids, right? They're not, they're not having kids. They're not getting pregnant. And, and as it says there in, in verse 11, uh, she was past the, the time of having children, they were older. Some people believe they were in their 80s or, or 90s. And so in the back of their minds, Sarah and Abraham have this promise from God playing through their minds. You're going to have offspring. You're going to have a child. That child is going to multiply you, right? In the back of their mind, that's playing there. But you have, you're presented with the reality. Like, let's just call it what it is. You're presented with the reality that I'm past the point of having kids, right? I might be too old for this, right? Just like biologically, it might not be happening anymore, right? And, and so you're presented with this situation where you have the promise of God, you've got the reality of the situation, and what does Sarah do? She considers it. This is not blind faith. Th- this is not blind faith. She considered it. She thought about it. She mentally had a thought that, that, that thought it is reasonable that God could still do what he said, he's going to do, even though I'm older in age. You with me on this, right? She, in her mind, is thinking, I see the reality before me, but I also know who God is, what He has done, and what He has promised to do. And so I'm going to camp out on that promise. Her consideration leads her to have faith. 
Let's look at Abraham. Look at her husband, Abraham. When God calls him to uh, take their now only son, so fast forward some years, take their now only son and go sacrifice him. So this is how it goes, right? So past the point where we're just talking with Sarah there. Uh, Fast forward, they do have a son. His name is Isaac. He starts growing up, and and God says to Abraham one day, he says, uh, you know that son that you are going to have your descendants kind of come through? You know that son that that I promised that you would have? Yeah, take him, go up on the mountain, and I want you to kill him for me, okay? So Abraham, in, this is where we're picking up, verse 9. Abraham, he considered God to be able to raise someone from the dead, and as an illustration, he received him back. So, so God promises to Abraham here, I'm going to give you this son. Through him, you're going to have many descendants, right? You're, you're going to be more than the stars in the sky. You're going to be this great big ma- nation, but also take him up on the mountain and go kill him as a sacrifice for me. So what does Abraham do? He considers it first. He considers it. That's what it says. Verse 19, he considered God. He considers it. He considers the situation. He considers who is the one who is calling me to do this? What has he done previously? What has he promised to do? He considered God who had been and realized that it was not above God's Uh, ability, it's not above God's power, it's not above God's authority to bring somebody back from the dead if he were to actually carry this out. And so what does he do? Gina just said it, right? Picks up his son the next day and says, son, let's go. Tells the wife, hey, we're going out for a little bit, right? And they, they go up this mountain and he's carrying the wood, right? But there's no sacrifice there. There's no lamb or anything to offer. And they get up to the top of the mountain and, and Abraham builds this, this altar, and then he takes his son, and he ties him up, and he lays, them on, he lays him on top of this altar, and, and Scripture says that he's, he's getting the knife, and he's pulling the knife back in order to kill his son, literally go through the action of sacrificing his son because God called him to, called, called him to and God stops him, and God stops him. He went out to about fully sacrifice his son. He considered it. Abraham considered it. Sarah considered it. And so we, as a part of faith, consider it. We consider what we're being called to. We consider what God uh, is doing in us. We, we consider all of it. We think on it. We poke at it a little bit, right? We prod it. Some of us really have to evaluate things in our lives. I get it. We, we have to consider it. But is reasoning, is considering, is thinking about it, the only aspect of faith? No. I'm going to argue no from the Bible today. Faith may begin with reason. It may begin with consideration, but it results in action. It results in us doing something. It results in faith being put out and played out in our hands and in our feet. Look at verse 8, Hebrews 11. Again, we're looking at Abraham here. This is earlier in his life. I know I'm kind of jumping around in Abraham's life, but um, so be it. Keep up with me. Um, Verse 8, by faith, Abraham, when he was called, obeyed. So God had called him, uh, follow me to this distant land, right? When he called, he obeyed and went out to a place he was going to receive as an inheritance. He went out not knowing where he was going. Abraham didn't, God calls him and says, hey, I'm going to lead you to this place. God calls him to this. Abraham didn't know where he was going in the end, but he considered, again, he considered the one who was calling him. He considered the one who was, who was telling him, hey, this is where we're going. And that was enough for him to then put that consideration into action and go and follow where God was leading him. Faith and obedience, oftentimes we separate these two things in our lives, but the reality is faith and obedience are two sides to the same coin. They're they're two sides to the same coin. You cannot argue biblically that faith is separate from action, from obedience. Faith is action that begins with us considering the one who is calling us and deciding whether he's trustworthy and deciding whether or not he is worth putting our faith in. Now, I I want you to hear something this morning because, you know, the argument is going to be made. Matt, it sounds like we earn our salvation through this. Matt, it sounds like we we have to do actions in order to be saved. Am I, 
Wow. Um, do, do, we have to, do we have to earn our salvation? And I will say emphatically, no. No, we do not earn our salvation. There's nothing we can do in order to earn our salvation. We are saved by the grace of God through Jesus Christ, period. We are saved because of what Jesus did on the cross, period. And we read about that in Ephesians chapter 2, for instance. We've been there a lot the last few weeks. Ephesians 2, starting in verse 8, Paul says, For you are saved by grace through faith. This is not from yourselves. It is God's gift, not from works so that no one can boast. Two things I pick up on this verse. Two things on on verses 8 and 9. One, uh, if it was based on us, if salvation was based on us doing things, we wouldn't be able to do good enough. There's no possible way that you can earn your salvation by your works. You are not good enough. I am not good enough. We are not good enough to earn our salvation. Secondly, let's play the hypothetical game and say that we actually could earn our salvation. I'm not saying that we can't. I'm saying hypothetically. Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit, knows how we are as human beings. If we could earn our salvation, what are we going to do? We're going to open our mouths, right? We're going to open our mouths, and we're going to talk about it. We're going to tell people about it. Look, I mean, verse 9 there, not from works so that no one can boast because we would boast about it. We would brag about it. We would tell people about it. We cannot earn our salvation. It is given to us by the grace of God. But, but you cannot read verse 8 and 9 without reading verse 10. Verse 10. For we are his creation, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared ahead of time so that we should walk in them. Our, if our belief in Jesus, if our faith, if we want to call it that, in, in Jesus does not result in our loyalty, in our commitment, in our fidelity, in our faithfulness to Jesus and the things he has called us to, if it doesn't result in those things, then our faith in him is bogus. We are just playing, just, just paying lip service to him. I mean, think about Abraham. Again, going back to that verse that we read um, from Hebrews. He was called to move, and so he moved. That's faith. God called him to sacrifice his son, and so he nearly went through the complete act. That's faith. Abraham considered who God was, who he had been to him, what he had done, and based on what Abraham knew about God, he acted in faith. You cannot separate faith and action. Turn over, if you have your Bibles, turn over to James chapter 2. This will be up on the screen as well. James chapter 2. Starting in verse uh, 14, we read about faith. It says this, what good is it? My brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works, can his faith save him? If a brother or sister is without clothes and lacks daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and eat well, but you don't give them what the body needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith, if it doesn't have works, is dead by itself. But someone will will say, You have faith, and I have works. Show me your faith without works, and I will show you faith from my works. You believe that God is one, you do well. The demons also believe. I sense, I read sarcasm there every time I read that verse, right, from James, where he's just like, oh, you're just just camping down on belief. Great. Even the demons do that. Even those against God do that, right? Right? And they shudder, verse 20, foolish man, you are willing to learn that faith without works is is useless. Are you willing to learn that faith without works is useless? Wasn't Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac, his son, on the altar? You see that faith was active together with his works, and by works, faith was perfected. Some of you maybe have uh, been around the Christian music circle long enough that the name Rich Mullins rings a bell. Anybody? Rich Mullins uh, was a really well-known, popular Christian music songwriter and artist uh, in the 80s and 90s especially, tragically died in a car accident in the 90s. Um, In 1987, which, just sub-note, that's the year I was born, okay? In 1987, throwing that in there for free, 
1987, Rich Mullins wrote the song called Screen Door. You ever heard it? You might recognize it. Let me read you just a, a, a few lines from it. It says this, faith comes from God in every word that he breathes. He lets you take it to your heart so you can give it hands and feet. It's got to be active. It's got to be alive. You got to put it into practice. Otherwise, it's about as useless as a screen door on a submarine. Faith without works, baby, it just ain't happening. I could sing it, but I'll spare you. Faith without works is like a screen door on a submarine. Not a lot of use, not a lot of function. We can find ourselves uh, this morning in this conversation of faith in a couple different areas, I think. Um, first, you can find yourself in a place to where you are in this consideration phase of, of your faith, where you are considering who God is, who Jesus is. Uh, maybe you're considering what a life following God looks like. Uh, maybe you're in a place to where you're just not sure, or maybe you're considering a call that, that he has placed on, on your life or you feel like you are called to do or be a part of. If you are here and you find yourself considering no matter where, no matter where you're at with that or no matter what you're considering, I just, I just want to first say that's great. Like, thank you for being here. If you're considering God, like if, if you've not made a decision, if you've not, you know, surrendered, committed your life to following him and you're just c- considering him, thank you for being here. Like genuine th- genuinely thank you for being here. That is, that is great. We're glad that you are here. Thank you for taking time to explore. Take, thank you for taking time to consider. I hope that you ask questions. I hope that you have conversations. I hope you continue to consider faith. I hope you continu- continue to ask those questions. We want to walk with you through this. We want to talk with you through this. We want to have conversations with you. We want to help answer your questions. We want to consider with you. Uh, We want to share our stories with you. We want to walk through this with you. And we believe that these type of conversations happen best in small groups. We call them 419 discipleship groups. We would love to help you get plugged into a, a discipleship group as well, where you can ask questions. You can build community together with other believers, and we can consider these things together. Let us, let us walk through this with you. So you may find yourself in that camp, and we hope that you take the step of asking questions and having conversations. You may find yourself in a different camp this morning as well, where you have a call, you have something that God is leading you towards, and you've done considered it. <laughs> you know that it is of God right? You know that it is something that God desires for you. You have the intellectual, mental side of it all figured out. There's no question in your mind, God is calling me to this. God wants this for me. But the reality is, is you're not living it out. You're not living it out. You've not, you've not put it into action. You've, you've made an intentional choice to just push that to the back of your mind and, and not act on it. The, the question really that you're presented with this morning I want to present is, is this, are you going to ever make that decision to transfer it from the intellectual side to the practical action side of it? You know what I mean? Are are you ever going to uh, allow the intellectual side, the consideration side, to then transfer to the practical action side of your life, or are you just going to keep this idea, this thought, are you just going to keep Jesus as an idea or a thought in your mind? There can be a number of different things that we are talking about when we're talking about living out faith. This can hit on a number of different levels. It, it can be faithful in, in what God's called us to do in baptism as an appeal to God for a clean conscience and joining in, in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. Some of us, God may be calling to, to be baptized. Some of us, it, living out faith may be uh, living out ongoing repentance in our life, where we view repentance not just as, as us saying, I'm sorry to God every time that I, that I do bad, but actively actually turning away from sin, actively going to war against our sin, actively like turning away from the sin that's holding us in our lives. Maybe for some of us, living out our faith means not picking and choosing which pieces of God's word that you want to follow and actually allowing him to transform your life completely from his word. Maybe for some of us, Acting and living in faith means responding to a, God, to a call that God has put on your life. And that call can look a number of different ways. Maybe there's, maybe there's biblical habits and, and um, 
yeah, biblical habits that, that God is calling us to, to instill in our lives. Maybe we need to step out and we need to start working on those habits. Maybe he's calling us to join into community with other people, to, to build relationships with other believers. Maybe he's calling us to serve, to engage in ministry, to put other people's needs in, uh, in front of us, in front of our own. Maybe he's calling you to go out and disciple somebody, to build a relationship with somebody in order to help them grow in their faith. Or, or maybe you're here and you find that um, God's calling you to act out, to live out in faith by doing something new, to engage in kingdom work possibly for the first time in your life, to stepping in a new, new area that God has called you to. We, we could go on and on with this all afternoon. The question really is, what are you going to do about it? Because I can sit up here and I can talk at you until I'm blue in the face. face. But what are you going to do? Are you going to actually do it? Are you actually going to put the action next to the consideration of faith? Faith is the consideration of what God has done in the past and putting that consideration into action in the present. Let us live lives, church. Let us be about practically, actively living by faith. Not because we know exactly how it's going to end, not because we know exactly how the plan is going to go, but because we have trust in the one who is calling us to it because of who he has been and who he continues to be in our lives. Heavenly Father, God, I'm thankful for your word. I'm thankful that um, words said, written 2,000 years ago can still pierce our hearts today, can still challenge us and convict us today. And God, I just pray for every single one of us, no matter where we're at on our journey of following you, I pray that um, you would put us in situations where our faith would be challenged, not just the mental side of it, but God, the action side of it. God, give us opportunities not to just mentally think about faith, but to practically live it out in our lives. And God, I pray for, for those of us considering what you've called us to in our lives, I pray that you give us the strength and the courage to step out and to follow, to put into action whatever you've called us to, God. We thank you. We love you. We thank you for Jesus. Pray all this in his name. Amen.
Like John said earlier, in the four corners of this room are communion stations. We just invite you over the next few songs. When you're ready, go take communion. Let's continue to worship.
for being here this morning. Go out, live on mission. We'll see you next week.